All right. Um, I think we have a a good crowd, you know. So um, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for making time to join us on this uh panel and um Africa week event that we we are hosting, right? Um, so the theme for our Africa week this year is owning agency, Africa's future and evolving path in the world. So we have been having some very interesting conversations and some very interesting uh, presentations from um, high level panels and uh, keynote speakers and everything. And um, if you miss more, most some of our events, maybe you can check our social media uh, for, for updates and on the things that we have been up to. But thank you so much, everyone, and welcome um, to this panel. So on this panel, we, we will be talking about uh, African elections in 2024, um, a critical discourse on elections on the continent. So why are we having this, the, this conversation and how, how does it link to African agency and everything? Um, the first important thing to notice that um, most of the, okay, we have 20 African countries that are going into elections um this year you know this is a big election year across the world not just in africa but um with african union having 54 member states and 20 that is a significant uh number of people that are going to be exercising um their agency in selecting <laughs> or choosing uh the leadership that's going to take africa in the next 5 years right so these elections obviously have an, an impact on the continent and in every uh, development sector and, and the peace and security and everything that is happening, right? So to help us um, delve into this, this critical issue, you know, uh, we have um, a, a few panelists that are going to help us, you know, and Maybe I should flag that uh, and say happy International Women's Day today um, to all the women um, that are listening in and are on the panel, right? So um, since it's International Women's Day, we all our panelists <laughs> are women who identify as women. So um, we have... Uh, we, someone who's going to be speaking to us, we have uh, Dr. Ndou, Dr. Delta Ndou. She is a communications and campaign specialist who has devised and implemented communication strategies for three winning African heads of state political campaigns in the last four years. In 2023, she was part of a technical team that piloted the use of AI in a presidential political campaign in Africa. And she has a considerable academic and practitioner-based knowledge of many of Africa's complex political and information ecosystems that have given rise to information disorders such as election-related disinformation and technology-facilitated violence against women. Delta is consulted for UN Women as a tech, gender, and elections analyst in Africa while interrogating the impact of technology in administering elections on the continent. And yeah, thank you, um, uh, Delta, for, for agreeing to be part of this conversation. Um, I will hand over to you so that you can give us your remarks. OK, um, thank you so much, Monia. Um... So I'll get right into it. And also I appreciate the, the acknowledgement of International Women's Day. So as Munya has already mentioned in his opening remarks, um, I'm gonna reflect on tech and elections on the continent, mainly because it's um, an area in which I am very well versed. So it's easier for me to have a conversation around that. But more importantly, because this particular conversation for me follows up on um, bigger and high level conversations I was part of and that I also had the privilege of witnessing in the International Political Expo 
the first of its kind that was hosted in Cape Town recently. So some of the points that I raise here, uh, my reflections following that uh, particular expo and the recommendations are actually drawn from the expo itself. So as Munya has already uh, noted, 2024 is a super election year in that over 180 million eligible to vote globally will have the opportunity to do so. But we are looking at the African continent where we've got the 20 countries with confirmed elections. So it's important to flag confirmed elections because on our continent, it's not guaranteed that the election will take place until it actually does. So we'll just say confirmed. And what I want us to flag, which I think will help in the conversation and which will foreground um, what I will be discussing is the fact that Africa has the costliest elections globally. Um, and what does that mean? What does that look like? So we know that already over half of all national level elections on the continent um, use some form of digital equipment or digital technology. And when we're saying over half, this is like stats from two, three years ago. So obviously it's way beyond that by now. And then what are those particular tech tools that we've seen uh, being you know, rolled out in different contexts? So you'll find biometric voter registration, which is becoming more and more commonplace, mobile technology, obviously. Artificial intelligence is gaining ground slowly. Uh, as Munya flagged last year, we did pi pilot uh, an AI messaging tool for a presidential campaign. And one of the reasons why we piloted in that particular context was because it was in a country that is known for very conflictual uh, elections. So um, we were looking for a way to campaign without having to make people gather physically because that tends to escalate into violence or skirmishes. So we thought maybe if we use AI, we might get, gain some traction. And then obviously blockchain for transparency, which I'll speak to um, in terms of some examples of countries that have adopted these technologies, election monitoring apps, social media, online campaigning, et cetera. So these are the tech tools that we've seen being embraced on the continent with varying uh, degrees of success in terms of implementation and with varying degrees of impact in terms of how they shape the outcome of the election. And so what exactly has, has this tech been used for? Like what specific electoral processes um, is, is tech being um, adopted for? So you've got voter registration, obviously, campaigning, monitoring, result reporting. Um, obviously, there is a high possibility that it's being used for other aspects far beyond this. But if we're looking mainly at the core electoral processes, this is um, a lot of, of where we see the technology being deployed. And, and the incentives for deploying these technologies vary from context to context. In some contexts, there's this belief, this um, romanticizing of the technologies, this assumption that if you use a certain technology, it will make the election more transparent or it will enhance accountability. While it's possible that these technologies can achieve those things, um, the more important thing is the context in which the technology is deployed. And I'll speak more to that as we go. So these are examples of tech adoption in, in, in African elections. Um, as I'll be speaking, I'll, I'll also raise other case studies. But for the DRC, what I found interesting was the, the time you know, the time frame in which they, they were early adopters of this technology all the way back in 2005. But I have to also flag that when they adopted the technology, they did it in a very cautious way because they only bought 10,000 kids in 2005. So obviously it wasn't meant for widespread deployment. It was more of, um, I guess they were piloting to see how exactly it works. But they were one of the first to adopt um uh, this technology. And uh, I will reference the DRC again because there is an election in which there wasn't a happy ending with regard to this particular technology, the PVR. And then Somaliland became the first country in the world to employ iris recognition tech in 2017. Uh, I'm also going to speak to that, but maybe just to uh, raise the question of um, 
given the context of Somaliland, what we know of Somaliland, is it ideally the, the country that should be investing or focusing in this high tech that hasn't been used anywhere else in the world? So I, I want us to think of it in terms of the ways in which Africa becomes a testing ground or a guinea pig for some of these technologies to be tested on and, and rolled out. Okay, we can proceed. And then other examples again, now not of tech adoption, but of tech investment, of the amount of money that's being poured, you know, and that's being, you know, spent on these technologies. We'll start with Kenya, which at the time was said to be one of the most expensive elections ever, half a billion dollars in 2017. And that particular price take of that election meant that the voter cost was $25.50. And even after all that technology that they deployed, the outcome was still disputed and the result was annulled. So that has to make us think a lot in terms of uh, what it means really to have the to deploy the technology in ways that will give us the outcomes we are hoping for. Uh, because if we if we um if we deploy technology without paying attention to the context and to other barriers, um, then obviously we'll be wasting a lot of money. And then another example again of this investment is Ghana, which spent 167 million in, in 2012, and which was way above what they'd spent in the previous election. So I just want us to keep these figures in mind because I think they will be crucial in terms of us uh, reflecting on the kinds of uh, tech we're investing in and what motivates those investments. What, what, what are our hopes and what are our fears? And what are those particular tech companies selling us, you know, it, to persuade us to invest such huge amounts of money in their, in their technologies? And then, of course, um, it, what I have to admit that over time, the cost of technology I mean, it can reduce, especially if you've got technology um, tools or platforms that remain stable over time. So for example, if you've got your BVR, the assumption is that the data that you have captured remains stable. It doesn't, it, it, it's, it doesn't fluctuate and you can upgrade those software without incurring further costs. But that only depends on the type of tech tool you're using. As we are all aware, technology evolves so fast. By the time the next election comes around five years, that's like half a decade later, chances are you might feel pressure or you might see the need to upgrade or to buy something entirely different. Uh, I'll circle back on this issue around procurement uh, later in the slide. So that's also just something to signpost. Now, some of the challenges um, with regard to relying on elections. And um, I, I like that the broader theme of uh, this conversation is around agency. So I, I, I wanted to really enter this conversation from the perspective of the kind of agency we can exercise on the continent where, when it pertains to tech. Do we have the technical expertise to say we've got agency over how we're running our elections? Do we have the technical know-how? Do we have our own startup companies? Do we have tech companies that are homegrown? Um, for us to say, oh yes, we have all this agency. If we're gonna spend so many millions uh, paying you know, uh, companies from, from outside the continent. But anyway, we'll proceed. So I just wanted this to be food for thought. Now, um, sorry, can we, it, okay, perfect. So some of the challenges again, now talking about the indirect influence, we're talking about agency, but we rely so much on technology that we don't control, sometimes technology that we don't understand, sometimes technology um, that we, we, we don't have in-house, quote unquote. Um, so what does that look like? What does that mean? in practical terms. So you look at tech companies or entities like Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica, and the fact that they first piloted, you know, their, their micro-targeted advertising in Africa. So that takes us back to that point I raised about, are we a testing ground for these tech companies? Are we guinea pigs? Are we lab rats? So they tested, they piloted in Kenya and Nigeria before they deployed it in the US and in the UK. 
And then, so that again brings us obviously to agency. And then now also looking at our electoral and social institutions, our electoral management bodies, uh, depending on um, the various contexts in different countries, you'll find in certain countries, especially in authoritarian contexts, um, positions, those that hold positions in AMBs don't always get those positions by merit, which means we can't assume their competency we can't assume their skill or expertise. And so we have no way of knowing if they can keep up with any of these technologies. Uh, some years back, um, there was a, a, a particular tech vendor that, say, that sold a, a tech, um, an election tech to Zimbabwe. It was from Israel, they called it Nukuv. And when the election outcome was disputed, the language that was used was to say, no, the, the, the Nikuv stole the election. So the understanding that something foreign, someone foreign had the power to change the will of the people. At least that was you know, the way in which it was framed. But if perhaps the EMBs at the time or those within the electoral body at the time had been able to explain how the technology works, what exactly it does, what people should expect, that level of transparency would have helped them understand what exactly um, the tool is supposed to do and how they'll benefit from it. So we find with adopting technology, especially from the perspective of, of our M EMBs, that there's an over-reliance on those who have created the technology to explain it to explain what it does. So it, this creates what, what you could call a technological elite. If there's only one person who understands what the thing's supposed to do, it actually makes the process more opaque as opposed to being you know, uh, more open, more transparent and allowing for accountability. Uh, you'll find in certain contexts like uh, in the Gambia, for example, where they, they will end up just resorting to traditional ways of voting, uh, especially where there are cases of high levels of illiteracy, where people will just join a queue and they'll use a stone to choose who they are voting for. And then whoever has got the higher pile of stones, oh, that's the winner. So it may, it's not high tech, it's not sophist, sophisticated, there's no sophistry involved, but it's very transparent to people. Because they're like, oh, we also, we know we're at the higher pile. And in some, in, in some spaces like um, Zimbabwe recently, one of the political parties for their primary um, candidate selection process, they went with um, this idea of just queuing behind the candidate you want. Say, so, okay, these are the people that wanna represent you, just queue behind whoever you're supporting. And then obviously whoever has got the longest queue is the obvious winner. So when you compare the transparency in those so-called archaic methods compared to the opacity that comes with technologies that we may not yet fully understand that are being adopted by electoral management bodies that sometimes are staffed by individuals who are, to put it nicely, technological laggards. So it already gives you a kind of picture around what agency looks like or does not look like in, in different contexts. And then I like this particular quote um, from Alternate Advisory. So they are a firm that's based in, in South Africa. And so they were reflecting basically on uh, what it means to adopt certain texts in the, in the context of uh, election management bodies. So they were observing how in some cases, a country may find themselves locked into a particular technology solution and only able to continue using its digital systems by maintaining a commercial relationship with a particular vendor that provided them. So, I mean, it's a long quote, but I, I felt like it sort of sums up the whole challenge around agency and, and what that looks like. So uh, we can proceed, Munya. So now speak again of agency and how you get logged into certain commercial relationships. Uh, you remember I mentioned that the DRC was one of the early adopters of BVR. Um, so some years later in, 20, in the 2011 election, they actually ran afoul with the particular technology and had to resort to suing a Belgian company all the way in Belgium over electoral fraud because of the procurement of the BVRs. And then you'll find that 
it, the decision to procure a certain technology over another sometimes is not necessarily made by the country that's looking for the particular tool or tech. Sometimes it's, it's made by whatever entity is sponsoring the procurement. So for example, in Kenya, where the Canadian government helps them secure the loans, and then it also insisted on, on deciding which company or which vendor they should work with. So if we're having a conversation about agency, then obviously these are some of the, the issues we're looking at. And then again in Kenya, voting data that was hosted on servers in France by the French company was no longer available when that data was required as part of you know, a, a Supreme Court challenge of the electoral outcome. So again, if we're saying agency, how can we speak about agency if we're gonna have our, our, our data hosted elsewhere, if you can't have access to it, um, if you have to resort to going outside of the continent to foreign courts to plead your case. So um, uh, let's proceed. So again, beyond just the issue of procurement, um, there are other issues around, um, you know, the adoption itself, the user adoption, the level of digital literacy. So do people even know how to use specific tech? So for issues like you know monitoring apps, for example, a lot of them have become more simplified. So obviously we, we were comfortable saying that there's a higher adoption of these monitoring apps across the continent, but, but it's important to remember that in terms of internet penetration, on the continent, there's still a long way to go because a lot of the population on the continent are in rural areas and a lot of rural areas are underdeveloped. In fact, in, in some campaign contexts, I've found um, that when we do a mapping of, of the information ecosystem, we find that radio is the most prominent um, sort of uh, medium that is accessible to more people. It has a lower barrier of access because all you need to do is be able to listen in. And a lot of the times it's cheaper than trying to access the internet. So again, our, our reliance on tech has to take into account the context in which this tech can be deployed. So even if we're the best intentions, the best tech, but if we're deploying it um, in, in context where uh, there is no literacy, there's no digital literacy. Again, it means we are making the process that much more difficult, that much more opaque. Um, so, and, and widening the digital divide, obviously. So in West Africa, for instance, Sierra Leone, they introduced blockchain technology in their 2018 uh, presidential elections. And while it was pioneering, obviously, and there were, there were so many challenges and criticisms. And the main one, the main one was the complexity of the technology. The idea that it, no one fully understands what it's supposed to do. And you find a lot of the times um, uh, when these very complex technologies are introduced, you have to ask yourself how those decisions are arrived at. In, um, in more democratic states, the assumption is that the EMBs have enough autonomy to make these decisions and to defend those uh, procurement choices. But in, author in author authoritarian contexts, you have to be a bit more skeptical to say, was this uh, somebody just wanting to line their pockets with a technology that no one will understand? No one can tell if it failed because of user failure or if it failed because it was a bad product. So again, if we're gonna speak about agency, then we also need to speak about our reliance or the extent to which we rely on external expertise and external um, technologies. Again, more examples, uh, case studies. So Ghana again implemented the BVR um, fairly more recently in 2020. And the challenges they encountered, so, um, I want us to appreciate again that sometimes technology is not the problem. Sometimes the problems are contextual. So issues like long queues at registration centers, that's not because of technology, that's because of the context or 
things like uh, logistical failures in, in those particular areas. And then issues to do with accessibility in remote areas, issues to and some of them legitimate, some of them just for grandstanding. So there, there's so much that happens around how we decide um, to hold the election and the processes and the tools that we then deploy or that we rely or then or that are prescribed for people to use. And then again, in, in Kenya, mobile technology, you said also ran into technical issues. And these issues were around concerns to do with network connectivity, for example, in remote areas. So again, you know, we go back to the issue of do we have the, the, the backbone infrastructure um, that allows sufficient internet penetration? And, and not just that, because even if we had it everywhere, it has to be accessible in terms of its cost as well, in terms of its pricing. So in, in, in the context of Kenya, um, the opposition parties raised objections. Uh, and some of those objections really are to do with um, not trusting the technology because they don't understand how it works or how it's supposed to, um, to really make a difference. And then beyond that, we've got the more obvious challenges around social media uh, and, and how it plays into political campaigning, uh, particularly at a time when we've got disinformation that's also aided by, by AI tools that make it so much easier to generate false um, content and to also spread it so much faster and deceive voters. And beyond that, the, the spread of hate speech and incendiary content. So with particular reference to hate speech, what we've seen on the continent is um, the big tech platforms, Meta uh, and, and others coming to, to the table and engaging governments like, like Kenya, like Zimbabwe to say, okay, we, we will have a plan for the election period. And this is what the plan will look like and this is how we'll roll it out. Because while we, we appreciate that they have a responsibility, obviously, to curtail hate speech on their platforms, we must also appreciate what it looks like, or at least the perception of it, um, to have these big tech companies having some kind of say um, in, in how the elections the, or in how the electoral environment itself um, pans out. Um, and then in terms of what does it all mean? You know, um, these are IP24 recommendations. And I just wanna say with the IP24 recommendations, um, the focus was on AI, but really it's applicable to, to tech and how we, we are adopting it on the continent. So first of all, the digital divide is the root of many inequities. Uh, so, like I said, um, African countries, they are not host to experts or tech companies that are responsible for developing election tech tools. And because of that, the ideal scenario until we have that kind of capability is to have greater collaboration with those who do. But even then, um, we have to understand that in that type of collaboration, there's a, a stronger chance that we don't have equal power as those who actually own the platforms. So uh, our, our relationship is not necessarily one of equal partnership. Again, that speaks to concerns around agency. Then we can proceed. And then again, the need for African countries to uh, work towards safeguarding their own elections, what does that look like? Does the AU have a position on how the big tech platforms, for example, um, should operate, what their obligations are, what their responsibilities are? Or do the tech companies decide which countries they can approach uh, based on whatever commercial imperatives drive, that drive them? What does that look like? What does election interference look like? And do we have a position around that in terms of safeguarding our elections? Um, I, I also want to obviously uh, point out uh, before it slips my mind, that some of these conversations become moot when we're, we're thinking in terms of authoritarian contexts where governments would just shut off, shut down the, the internet. So it, it then becomes pointless to have the conversation at all uh, because now there is no access in, in those uh, particular contexts. But we're saying that generally there should be standards 
there should be regulations, there should be a way in which the African Union and, and any other relevant bodies can position themselves so that they have uh, some kind of bargaining power. Um, you know, to engage uh, some of these bigger tech platforms. We do know that certain tech platforms, the likes of Meta have been summoned uh, before the EU to answer and, and to also uh, sort of be given guidelines uh, in how they operate within EU context. So it, it's unclear whether the AU has sought to position itself in, in, in similar ways. And then obviously they need to ensure that the internet remains open. Like I said, um, we, we, do, we wouldn't want a situation where there are shutdowns and these shutdowns are done under the pretext that, oh, it's for national security, it's for national interest, which we know tends to be the default for, for the more authoritarian regimes. So again, looking at the role of um, the tech platforms and whether or not they can localize some of their interventions. So we know that in terms of hate speech, we've seen platforms that will have uh, content moderation as part of their safeguards. But we've also recognized that these interventions are insufficient in contexts where people use their local languages. Because when they use their local languages, they can obviously circumvent um, those uh, algorithms. And then uh, additionally, campaign related content needs to have alerts. So what would that look like? Again, it comes back to the issue of, of language as well. To say to what extent are we able to get these platforms to include our local languages so that there is no circumvention, which can be done remotely or through deployment of regional and local task teams in, in African countries. So you'll have examples of Meta that had set up a whole uh, more localized uh, content moderation uh, based in Kenya that obviously at the moment has, has since been disbanded. But the, the idea that it's possible to invest in that kind of, of effort to counter hate speech and also counter disinformation. And then the role of our governments, um, the role of our political parties, our media entities, our educators, tech companies, EMPs, all of them working in terms of policy development and education on election technologies. So a lot of the skepticism, a lot of the, the fear and the doubt and the mistrust obviously would be um, mitigated if people really understood what the technologies are, what they do, and there was higher levels of media literacy, digital literacy, and um, more initiatives uh, simplifying these very high sounding complex technical terms in local languages and making them very, very accessible. So I think I'll, I'll stop there for now. Uh, um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Talta. Um, so much to unpack and so so many um, issues that you have raised in your presentation. Um, I just want to let everyone know that we ca you can um, drop in your questions and uh, your comments um, in the in the question uh, sector, and then we will be able to get back to them and. Um, uh, any questions that you have for for any of our panelists? You know, so quickly moving on. Um, I think we're going to move to Shannon, Leslie Arnold. So Shannon is a social scientist and a political analyst. She's currently working as an analyst on Southern Africa for the International Crisis Group, uh, focusing on elections and foreign policy. She's an African Women Peace and Security Fellow with the African Leadership Center. She and she completed a recently completed an MSc Global Leadership and Peace Building here at King's, uh, where she graduated top of her class and received a, an academic prize for her dissertation. In addition, she has an MPhil in African Studies from the Center of Gender and African Studies in the University of Free State, South Africa. And she has a background of being an activist focused on relates on issues related to gender-based violence in South Africa. Shannon, you can go ahead and share your slides and speak to us about um, South Africa in general and the elections. Thanks, Munya. Let me share my screen.
full, visible, and audible. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Fantastic. Um, okay, so thank you for the introduction, uh, Munya, and thank you for the invitation. I'm really ex excited to share um, my thoughts on South Africa's election today. So um, I've titled the presentation um, A 1994 Moment. And the reason for this is because South Africa, I suppose there's a lot of doom and gloom around South Africa, but the main reason is because it's a watershed moment in the sense that what we're looking at is a moment where we're, we could be looking at a future where one party rule isn't the norm. So the watershed moment is the thing for today. Why is it not? Oh, it's not moving to the next slide. Uh, let's try this way. Okay. So um, South Africa, just for some context. So what is happening? Um, we have our general elections on the 29th of May. So the general elections are comprised of both a national election as well as provincial elections. So you'll have South Africa's voting for MPs. Um, in the National Assembly, which is the lower house of parliament. And then you'll also have South Africans voting for what we call MPLs, which are the MPs of your provincial legislatures. So the MPLs are also very important. The reason for that is because um, your provincial legislatures control important aspects of governance, such as healthcare and education. But more importantly, they also, um, they choose the delegates that then represent um, parties at the National Council of Provinces, which is our upper house. So we have those two concurrent elections. The other thing that is important about this election is that this is the first time that South Africa will have also independent candidates on the national ballot. So those are some of the, the, the factors just to keep in mind. So why is this a watershed moment? It's kind of become common knowledge that the ANC is, well, the ruling party for those who aren't in the know, is in a state of decline for want of a better term. So what we're looking at is the possibility of a national coalition government, and that's not that likely, which I'll get into later, um, but more likely we're going to be seeing national, I mean, provincial coalition governments in a number of the different provinces. So rather than um, signaling the end of ANC rule, what this is showing is that the South African democracy is developing. It's important to keep in mind that the South African democracy is a young democracy, and what we're entering into is some kind of political maturity. So we're looking at coalition governments in, in the future. So the bigger picture of ANC decline, just to uh, uh, give some context, right? So um, in the heyday, as I've, uh, as I've um, named it here, of Tabo Mbeki, what the ANC enjoyed was a great majority. So high 60s, um, in many of the provinces, 70s in many of the provinces, and then at a national level, they enjoyed a high 60 margin in the um, in the National Assembly. The Thabo Mbeki era had different um, difficulties, which is not the, uh, the, the topic of this conversation. But the main thing is that in his era, we had 6% GDP growth rate. And so we it was happier then. We had le less unemployment and things. There was a mood, a national mood that we were on the right path. And then from there, we have um, Jacob Zuma coming in. And um, so commonly the media refers to Zuma's tenure as the nine wasted years. That's up for de debate. Um, but he's most famous for the era of state capture. And what came with that was just the general degradation of, um, and hollowing out of our state's institutions, um, the basic collapse of local government, and then the increase in markers that make this country more tense. So higher levels of unemployment, higher levels of crime, and then um, kind of the almost the consolidation of what we call load shedding in South Africa, which is our rolling blackouts because of the collapse of our electricity grid. So income, we have um, Simul Ram Cyril Ramaphosa, and what was he ran on the ticket of a new dawn. And myself, among many analysts, were. Um, rode the ride of the new dawn and then were deeply disappointed. So the the new dawn is was the idea that Cyril Ramaphosa as a more uh, business friendly um, figure would then um, kind of bring back the heyday of Tabo Mbeki. And 
Unfortunately, um, the, the Ramaphosa camp argues that the nine wasted years of Zuma have, that's what he's been dealing with. And, but <laughs> the difficulty of that is that many criticize his leadership. He's been very inactive and um, load shedding has got worse. Unemployment is um, extremely high. Unemployment among the youth is extremely high as is corruption and crime. So you have this gradual decline in the almost moral authority of um, the ANC and the, the public's general trust in the ANC to deliver. And that's kind of what brought us to this point presently. So what we look at then is the heyday of Tabo Mbeki here, 2004, with you know almost 70% of the vote share. And then in 2019, um, the ANC managed to get just 57.5. Now, that might not seem like that significant a drop or something to be concerned about, but when you take a look at your local elections, the picture is very different, right? So in the national vote share across the country um, in the local elections in 2021, the ANC only managed to, to secure about 46% of the vote. And um, what you did see is quite a large increase in um, two of the main opposition parties, that being the Democratic Alliance, which runs the um, governs the Western Cape, um, which many people might know because of Cape Town, and then you have the EFF. So what we have is um, the DA and the EFF gaining ground and the ANC losing ground. But what's even more interesting is that the ANC is particularly hemorrhaging votes in the country's urban centers. So we're looking at Gauteng, where um, which is our largest economy, um, KwaZulu Natal, which hosts Durban and the ports of Richard Bay and then the Western Cape. So what we have seen is that the ANC is slowly becoming a rural party, which is quite interesting because it's following the footsteps of many of its fraternal liberation parties elsewhere on the continent, such as ZANU-PF, um, the MPLA, Frelimo, among others. So right now, what we can see in this map from the 2021 elections is that the ANC um, has lost ground uh, in your, in here, um, so in the Western Cape, the growth of the DA, you can see in Gauteng, in the metros of Pretoria and Johannesburg, and um, it has retained, but is slowly losing support in those rural provinces. All right, so the polling in South Africa at the moment, obviously polling is not an exact, exact science and I won't pretend that it is, but um, so what we have seen is that um, different polls predict that the ANC will move between somewhere in the low 50s and somewhere in the mid 40s. And that is really dependent on voter turnout. So voter turnout specifically among the youth and um, in the urban areas. So because the, the opposition is most strong in the urban areas, if the opposition manages to turn people out in those areas, especially the youth, which is one of the largest voting blocks, um, then we might see the ANC dipping much further. On, in contrast, if the ANC manages to gather its rural voting base and push up the election um, on the day of the polls, then we might see something different. So these are some of the dynamics, but for time, I think I'll skip over these and we can discuss it um, during the question. So just a brief overview of some of the opposition to keep in mind. So we have the Democratic Alliance, um, now, they were on a growth trajectory, but they've really struggled with leadership and they can't seem to shake their white liberal image. And so they can't seem to gain the vote of the black middle class. Um, the DA is the leader of a multi-party charter, which is a coalition agreement. And basically it aims to uh, form a minority government, except the likelihood of this is, is not great. Then we have the IFP, which is gaining ground in KZN, and uh, the resurgence of, of, of IFP is related to um, the ANC losing their, their, I guess, their symbolic symbol of President Zuma, which we'll get to when we, we discuss the MKP. And then finally, we have the EFF, which has gained significantly over the last um, five years. And by the polls estimations, they might push out the DA as the official opposition. Now, the voting block for the EFF tends to be those um, young black born free, so those born after apartheid, who are disillusioned by the governance of the ANC and don't have, share the same kind of loyalty to, as their parents to the ANC. So now we have the Zuma factor, 
Um, that massive, uh, almost 70% uh, control of parliament that ANC had was largely because of Zuma and Zuma's, um, his, his electioneering tactics in case then. Zuma is astute at using his uh, Zulu ethnicity and he has thrown a spanner in the works by deciding to back the Mponto Wesizwe party over the ANC. So Zuma is not the de facto leader of this party. He can't himself run for president, but the MKP has shown a great challenge to the IFP, ANC and EFF in KZN. It's an incredibly disputed provincial election and we're not so sure what's going to happen. What we do know is that the MKP is outperforming both the IFP and EFF in by-elections. So it is pointing towards something that could be a very competitive election. So what are the different dynamics telling us? South Africa is designed to be a multi-party democracy, but the constitution mostly only refers to a majority government. And that's the only thing that we've ever really known. In, in design, it is set up for coalitions, but in practice, those co coalitions are a gray area. So we have coalitions at local level of governance, but they have not inspired much confidence. I currently live in Johannesburg and I feel the impact of coalitions uh, currently, there's no, not, not a lot of water in the city, and part of that is because of serv service delivery problems, because coalitions are very unstable, had multiple mailers over the years, and um, yeah, so there's a knock to service delivery, and then quite a um, accepted concern about what that would look like at a national level. The other thing is that... Um, so the most likely um, outcome is that the ANC will somewhere fall between around 48 and 52%, in which case the likelihood is that they'll choose a much smaller party that they can easily manipulate. If they fall way by, below, the, their likely partner is the EFF. So some risk factors um, quickly. So a large uh, concern for observers in this year's elections is the risk of violence. So the concern here is connected to what we saw in um, 2021 in South Africa, where we had large scale public um, violence and rioting, which led to the death of over 300 people. So part of that was connected to Zuma's arrest um, for, con for ignoring a constitutional court order and for being in contempt of court. So the interesting thing here is that it's, there would be like two levels of possibilities. The one level is that what happened with that violence is that there was strategic interference, but then that led to a larger spillover effect of violence because of a high level of grievance in communities. So just because people block roads or burn tires, that doesn't necessarily mean that there'll be widespread public violence. The assumption is that um, the procurement network in KZN is connected to organized crime, and many of those are affiliated to ANC networks as well. And the fear is then that once the procurement networks get destabilized by a coalition government, that those actors might then look to um, destabilize the formation of a coalition government, um, and then maybe look to stoke something similar. But again, that really depends on the level of grievance in KZN at that point. Another risk factor is a disinformation campaign. So currently Zuma is really punting this one where um, and his acolytes among the MKP, where they are threatening the integrity of the, our election um, commission, which is generally accepted as being very independent, um, and claiming that the, the commission is, um, has been in cahoots with the ANC before to rig elections. And then, so those are some of the tensions that exist. And then we've already seen markers of um, tensions between MKP and ANC members in KZN, so, so far, there have been 40 incidents of violence reported, um, which were all over the by-election period you know, um, three weeks ago or so. So those are some of the risk factors associated with the South African election. And then these are just some images from what the riots, and that's kind of part of the reason for the general feeling of um, what will happen next. And then finally, I've included some questions here, but for time's sake, I think I can um, end the presentation. I think the main thing here is that South Africa is entering into uncharted waters and it will come with teething problems. But overall, it's optimistic to see different parties trying to enter into coalition agreements because it shows that there's this um, tendency 
toward power sharing as opposed to power keeping. And I think that is an optimistic outcome for our continent, especially in the context of democratic backsliding more generally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon, uh, for, for that presentation. I'm particularly intrigued about um, the question about what does it mean? What do South African elections mean for the region? Um, knowing very well that the ANC has always uh, supported um, the other regional governments and somehow gave a semblance of stability in the region, you know. So if ANC is, loses its power, what does it mean when um, right-wing parties uh, gain generally for the region? I think that's that's a very interesting question that you raised there. But thank you so much for that insightful presentation, you know, and, you know, um, gathering the... Uh, a, what we'll call a, a, a functioning democracy. And, a, you know, it would be nice We, when I was thinking about it, like how to have a, a holistic uh, conversation on, on African elections, you know, to bring in someone from um, South Sudan, which is a very new addition to the African Union, you know. So we have um, Catherine Charles Vitaliano. Catherine he holds a bachelor's degree in public and private law from the Catholic University of Eastern Africa uh, and a master's degree in global leadership and peace building from King's College. She serves as a programs manager. She's a research, she was a fellow, she's a fellow of the African Leadership Center and has served as a technical support to the civil society representative on public finance and management oversight. So Catherine is originally from South Sudan, and I think it's a it's a critical addition and a very important conversation to hear to hear about the elections in South Sudan. Um, Catherine, over to you. Thank you, Munya. Uh... Let me share my screen. Uh, is that uh, clear and am I audible? Yes, 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 you can go ahead. Okay, thank you so much, Munya. And for the interest of time and given um, the really elaborate and analytical, um, you know, points that the, my fellow panelists have raised, I'll try my best to um, rush through my presentation so that we can have a more um, interactive discussion. So to start with, um, like what Munya have mentioned, I'm from South Sudan. South Sudan gained its independence from Sudan in 2011 after a long um, civil war that happened since 1956. So, and it's a new country. And so, however, um, in 2013, the country went into conflict, um, and the conflict basically is a rival between the main um, the main party, which is the SPLA, Sudan People Liberation Movement. So it was between the president and then his vice president. So in 2013, when the country went into the conflict, of course, the regional bloc, IGAD, was managed to negotiate a peace agreement, which is... Um, peace agreement on the resolution of the conflict in South Sudan. But however, the country went again. So the 2015 peace agreement collapsed. And there's also another conflict that happened in 2016, which sort of like revitalized the, um, the, the, the 2015 uh, peace agreement. So just to move fast forward, at the moment, South Sudan is implementing the revitalized peace agreement is more or less of uh, a, a transitional uh, government of national unity between the two principal um, uh, parties to the agreement, which is the SPLA IG and then the SPLA IO and other political parties group. However, in terms of the election, South Sudan have never exercised um, you know the, the the right to vote for their candidate because be, because of the conflict actually the election was scheduled to happen in 2015 but then we went into conflict in 2013 and there is a series of extension that you know in 2015 we were scheduled to go for election and it was extended to 2018 it was extended to 2020 it was extended to 2022 and at the moment and like like what um 
Dr. Doc was saying that as much as that, yes, there's 20 countries in Africa that is going to have election, but then it's not yet confirmed. So in South Sudan case, it's going to be our first election, but at the same time, it's not really confirmed whether we're going to go for election in December 2024. So just to situate the context, so like what I mentioned earlier, that at the moment we're implementing a peace agreement and we are moving from, uh, we are transitioning to a more democratic um government. So looking at the history of a post-conflict uh, countries and the way uh, the neoliberal peace uh, approach, you know, is the sort of like a, a template of how after peace agreement, right away, you know, a country must go through election and constitution making process. So for the past um, nine years, we are implementing series of peace agreement which has been extended by different political party because of the key prerequisite that you know the peace agreement has highlighted like for example uh, the security sector reform so you know is not in terms of unification of forces because throughout 2013 there's a lot of militias there's a lot of you know there's a lot of intercommunal violence that is happening across the country. So for us to have a more conducive uh, environment for election, it's the process of the security sector reform needs to you know, happen in terms of the DDR process, but we are not seeing it at the moment as much as that, you know, the parties are implementing this peace agreement for the past nine years. We still, they, this part of, uh, in various parts of uh, South Sudan, there's still intercommunal conflict that is happening. We still have whole out group like the National uh, Salvation Front that is still fighting with either SPLIG or with SPLIO. So as much as that we are talking about election, we have to also be critical what kind of environment are we going to conduct the election in it. So in terms of the security sector reform is lacking, but not only that, uh, another factor that we need to also take into consideration before going to election is the geopolitical context. And, and as you have seen earlier in the map, South Sudan is bordering Sudan. And with the current crisis that is happening in Sudan, when we are having our conflict, most of, um, most of South Sudanese flee to Sudan as refugee. But then right now, because of the crisis in Sudan, we are seeing that there's a lot of Britannies that are forced because of the crisis. But then at the same time, we're also looking at the you know, refugees that are coming from Sudan. So in this case, in, in a situation whereby, you know, there's still part, uh, there's still some uh, in part of South Sudan, there's still conflict that is happening. And we are having refugees that are coming in, but also we're having forced returnees that are coming in and the environment is not uh, conducive or the security in, security wise is not, you know, conducive. So still, if we're going to say that South Sudan is going to have an election in 2024, in what kind of environment that are we going to conduct the election? So this is in, in part of um, the security sector re reform, but then let's look at the governance aspect of it. So since we got our independence, we don't have, uh, we are being governed by transition, transitional constitution, and it's been amend amended for 13 times now. So again, the peace agreement required that we should go for a constitution making process, but at the moment, yes, the commission to the uh, National Constitution Review Committee has been appointed, but then I and but then it's still that you know to go for a constitution making process is a social contract between the state and its citizen, and just not having that access you know to to reach out to other you know part of the country because of the insecurity that is going on. How are we going to negotiate a social contract with just a, a few? So it become very difficult that yes, we as much as that we go for election in 2024, but which instrument is it? Uh, which instrument is going to govern the, the 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 government that will come in if we voted for them? Are we going to still use the transitional constitution as it is, or are we going to rush the constitution making process? So those are some of the questions that South Sudanese are asking themselves. Like we are weighing whether we go for election or whether we should continue to have transitional government so that we can negotiate a social contract that have everyone voice in it. 
but not only that so another aspect that you know another aspect that you know is the element of the oversight body like the elect the national electoral commission the political parties uh council so this 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 political institution or this state institution is underfunded and i and i think one of the colleagues who I men was mentioning about how election is very expensive in africa and all this kind of thing but looking at the south sudan context you see that a country that gains is it is independent in 2011 with a very premature uh, oversight you know bodies but then yet at the same time there's those uh, political parties that negotiate powers between them. And if you look at the National Electoral Commission, even the chairperson is not, um, is, is, is a political you know, appointee. So where is the element of democratic process if you have uh, political appointees in, in, in oversight bodies? Like how can we trust National Electoral Commission and yet is an appointee of political party A or political party X. So these are the key questions that, you know, as we talk about election, you know, and as we talk about democratic governance and democratic processes for us as South Sudanese, we have so many questions than, than answer, you know, and then and looking at the actors and then looking at the regional, um, you know, looking at the regional bodies, of course, we see the African Union has appointed the C5 um, countries and South Africa is sharing it to give that sort of like, you know, support or that kind of leadership to, you know, to take South Sudan to a more democratic process. But then at the same time, like what my colleague was mentioning earlier, South Africa is also going through their own, you know, their own situation. So what, like, where are we going as South Sudan? So that's the question that, as I was writing this presentation, I'm just thinking it through. So if you look, if, if, if you see, like, why, why do we need, you know this election like if you ask any south sudanese like why is this election important because as much as there's all these challenges that is happening you know the peace agreement is not being implemented for the past nine years uh the intercommunal violence is happening um there's no strong oversight uh bodies and stuff like that i have just put this picture specifically for us to to look at it like the aspiration of south sudanese is for us to have sustainable peace because even you know even peace agreement is more of a power sharing and it doesn't translate to you know to the public or the citizen good so for south sudanese whether this election is going to be fair or free let it happen so that we sort of like you know deal away with the with a bloated government of more than five vice president you know and one president so the question is not about whether the election will be fair or free but rather we just need to move past this transition period if it's going to bring sustainable peace if it's going to you know give us a chance to you know to bring change if it's going to you know if it's going to if it's going to give us a space that we can negotiate for a, a, a new constitution that at least that it it will reflect you know the voice of the people why not so for south sudanese it's 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 not it's not a question of what is going to be fair or free but rather it's a question what is it going to get us you know if it's going to bring sustainable peace why not because it's just that people are fed up of transition or transition governance you know so and for me to just um conclude my my point is that um yes the the time is too short for 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 the political parties you know to meet all the requirements in terms of the security sector reform in terms of unification of the forces even voters registration even you know even to conduct uh, or even to produce a constitution because the timeline between now we in March now we have less than 10 months to go to conduct an election and yet the environment is not conducive enough but at the same time we are looking at the lack of political will for the past nine years 
the political parties are still negotiating for 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 a more power sharing governance rather than looking at the will of the people so the delay in the process of you know unification of the forces in in terms of um just 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 allocating enough resources to the um oversight bodies to conduct their work and then at the same time the question of that the constitution making process is actually tied to the election and i think for me i will look at it that's the dis that's that's the disadvantage or that's that's the disadvantage of negotiating a peace agreement because right now we are this limbo whereby should we have because the peace agreement has clearly mentioned that you know in chapter six that you know for election to happen there must be a constitution in place but at the same time you know south sudanese are saying that for constitution to be people like process we need to negotiate people need to be consulted so right now we are this limbo whereby the constitution making process is tied to election so are we going to you know and it's creating a divide attention some people want a more people let you know constitution making process and people should go through a referendum so that election must happen so these two processes are tied together and so and at the same time we are looking at that you know democratic process should be incremental it should not be in a sort of template like in south sudan like right now it's just peace agreement so it shouldn't be put in a in a template rather than it should be in in a very increment uh incremental process for people to negotiate what kind of state that they want so and and again that just what i want to say that uh in terms of the citizen aspiration we are left with should we just you know, go for election that is, we know for a fact that it will not meet, you know, the democratic principle whereby it should be fair, fair and free, or we should continue to be in a quantum transition, transition, transition. So for South Sudan, it's, it's a more of a question and it needs a political uh, leadership that has vision. And I'm so, and I'm so glad that we are talking about the African agency and it's really a high time that as African are taking agency, you know, South Sudan, especially with the African Union, there's high time for them now to, to, to pour in more of, you know, political leadership, political support to South Sudanese so that they can get through this process. But if we, because it's it's more of a question and we are not seeing any viability whether this election will happen in 2024 thank you um thank you so much uh catherine um such a complex uh, you can stop sharing um conversation that you are bringing in uh, on um on south sudan you know we we have had I believe one of the most holistic um uh I conversation of what the what is happening on elections in, in Africa. You know, um maybe for a minute or so, I would like to bring in uh Nkanyiso Smelani. So Nkanyiso is does some work on mapping um uh, elections in Africa and so to give uh a, to respond to any of the panelists um uh, and what they presented in in a minute or two in Kanye, so please. All right, thank you. Just to check if I'm audible. Yes, yes, we can hear you clearly. All right, wonderful. No, thank you so much for allowing me to to share insights. I think um, firstly, happy uh, International Women's Day to all the ladies who've shared, and um, they've shared very insightful and important points. Um, I think just I'll highlight just one thing um, from each presentation. Um, which I thought was quite key amongst other things. I think, firstly, um, Dr. Delta's um, presentation really spoke to uh, the importance of technology and how we are going to integrate technology into our democratic process processes in Africa, particularly um, elections. I know that in a lot of African countries, there's a lot of skepticism around using elections and 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 really um, the level of safety. Of, of elections. So I'm wondering, perhaps as a as a comment or a question uh, uh, from Dr. Del Delta, um, what is the level of safety um, uh, in terms of the, the use of um, technology, 
um, in elections in Africa? And do we have the the, the right context um, to allow for 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 more technological use? Purely because obviously in uh, the majority of the African continent um, um, is underdeveloped, and so access and inclusivity is is, is a problem. Um, so just on that point, but we also have seen that um, you know particularly in South Africa. Um, that uh, online platforms have also increased, for example, online registrations um, in South Africa, um, just going into Shannon's presentation. And really, um, that speaks to me the, the importance of, of, of youth ownership and youth participation in the electoral process, um, not just in South Africa, but across the continent this year. It's going to be so key um, because we have a, a, what I would say is an aging leadership um, and a very youthful population. And so there needs to be a balance and we need to start seeing a transition in terms of um, the, the leadership that we have. Um, and so having more young people is, is what I'm looking forward to in the South African context, more young people um, getting registered to vote and uh, being able to vote. And not only that, but more young people being in positions of power and being elected in, in positions of power is what you need to see. And I think that will assist in, 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 in preventing and arresting the democratic decline, not just in, in, in South Africa, but across the cont continent and really instill um, democracy and consolidate it for the future. And lastly, in terms of uh, um, Catherine, uh, Catherine's presentation, it really speaks to highlights the issues surrounding negotiating elections in the context of um, um, security challenges. Um, and, and South Sudan is not just the only one. Um, we also know of uh, issues of, of insecurity in Libya, Burkina Faso, Mali, uh, Chad, all these countries are going to, um, are scheduled to have elections this year. So really, it, you know, we, we don't want to see more and more postponements because also that contributes to um, a democratic backsliding. We want to see um, elections being a part of uh, South, um, uh, the continent's um, democratic life. And um, it really uh, um, will try and uh, prevent and um, uh, mitigate the, the rise in unconstitutional changes of government. And so in doing that, it is so important that we invest and uh, uh, are really um, investing into constitutional changes of government. Um, the the key point there is obviously, and the key avenue there is elections. Um, so I think um, I, I, I think it was very insightful presentations from all the, the speakers, and 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 just uh, as an emphasis, um, we have also seen the the important role of of courts being. Uh, in the electoral process over the past couple of months and years. For example, just now in Comoros in, in January, we saw that the the Electoral Commission had announced that the voter turnout was 62% rather than 57%, um, which was validated by the courts. And so that caused, caused some protest and instability for, 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 for a couple of weeks in Comoros because there was allegations of perhaps the, the elections being rigged. Similar situation in Senegal where the elections were postponed. There was a judicial um, intervention where the, 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 the courts stated that the, the elections must not be postponed any further and need to be held um, as soon as possible. Um, so this also, this year we're also uh, going to be looking very closely at the role and increased role of, of the courts in safeguarding democracy and elections on the continent so that democracy continues to be consolidated. Um, I, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, That's uh, a good uh, roundup, you know, and because of our time, um, I'll ask, um, I'm not seeing so many questions. Um, most of the questions are, uh, Directed to Dr. Ndo. Um, um, I don't know which ones you would like to respond to. Um, but mainly, yeah, if I so saw you responding to someone on the on the chat box, but maybe just to verbalize for those that miss them. Dr. Delta. Um okay, yeah. So yeah, I wish we had we had more time. <laughs> Clearly, um, so just to uh, respond to briefly what Kanyuso asked, and then I see there are some questions that were also typed. Can I tackle those as well as quickly as I can? Yes, yes, please. Okay, so Nkanyuso, in terms of whether Africa has the context 
you know, to adopt tech. Uh, definitely it does. It does because we know that technology is borderless. So even if we said, no, we're not ready for it, those, those technologies are being adopted. Um, and also with the, the radical transformation of technology with technologies like Starlink, for example, some of the challenges that we, I flagged in terms of access to, to the internet, these are challenges that may very easily be resolved. But again, all those issues also um, make us confront regulations, regulatory issues in different countries. So you'll find some countries will say, no, uh, a technology like Starlink is a, is a threat to national interest. So in terms of whether or not it's, it's, it's ready, yes, it is. Um, mainly also because the biggest internet, uh, we like to say in, 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 our, in our campaigns, that the biggest internet in Africa is WhatsApp. So it's not really um, something highly fancy or it's way more accessible. And a lot of, um, you'll find a lot of um, mobile network operators actually try to, to uh, push volumes by having packages designed just for WhatsApp, making the price slightly more affordable. But beyond that, the, the content that's on social media, the content that's on WhatsApp, it travels. It doesn't stay on those platforms. So you just need one popular opinion leader in a family who will report what they saw on Twitter, what they saw on Facebook, which is why we need to be very aggressive about how we confront disinformation, because that information is not static. It's flowing into other ecosystems, into other mediums. You'll find in remote areas, there's an appetite for information. Um, there's, there's one uh, civil society uh, organization in Zimbabwe that was working with communities that are so remote. And they found that teachers at schools would give their mobile phones to taxi operators that drive every day to the, to the, main, um, um, to the main district and stay there the whole day. And then they're getting messages, they're getting WhatsApp. And then when their phones come back in the evening, they review all those messages, oh, this is what happened. But obviously there's a time lag. But when they are, have access to radio, that time lag doesn't matter. But also if, the, if you're in countries where the, the media is state control, it then means you're, you're susceptible to propaganda as well. So again, the issue of access to alternative information um, it, you know, it becomes pertinent in that regard. And then um, just to be very, very quick in terms of the role of the youth in um, elections, um, absolutely crucial. Uh, for example, the youth vote was a very critical swing a vote in the Lesotho elections in 2022. Um, the, 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 the person who won that election had formed their party six months prior. And mm. what they did is instead of using traditional methods of campaigning where you just print a lot of t-shirts and everything, they hired um, technical experts to just use data, ha had them crunch the data, crunch the numbers, and they were able to tell them the number of votes they needed in each constituency in order to win, which was 3,276. So that's all that man did. He just said to his people, have you gotten 3,000 yet? Have you gotten 3,200 yet? Have you gotten 3,276? So we know that data is important. And if you are deploying tools like AI, then it's easier for you to crunch those numbers, those big data. But then it also brings the issue of, of privacy and how that data is stored and where it goes and whether it's secure. So again, we speak about agency. If we're being told that you can't access the data because, well, it's in, it's in Belgium or it's in France, so it, it, it obviously um, makes us aware that we definitely need a way of, of um, safeguarding our own um, data and, and privacy as, as the continent. And then there's a question, this will be my last point. There's a question from um, about the AU, yes. The potential of the AU to negotiate with big tech companies. Yeah, so, okay. Definitely, I think there is that potential. I, I say this because we've seen that in terms of uh, commercial endeavors, the, the countries that have been able to step up and, and place very specific restrictions to big tech companies like Meta. And you've seen uh, in, in countries like South Africa, 
people actually taking matter to court and, and winning or at least having some policy reform or in Kenya as well. So if we can do that in terms of commercial endeavors, we should be able to, to leverage that same power, that same influence when we're not speaking to uh, issues pertaining to our democratic processes on the continent. And over and above that, you know, we don't need to invent the wheel. Uh, it, it, it's still okay to look at what uh, maybe the EU has and what it looks like and how, how do we tailor it to our own context to have that conversation. Because um, one of the key things we have to remember is that Africa is a fast growing market for these tech companies. So that's where our leverage is. Um, so I, I hope that that helps. Sorry, in the interest of time, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Delta. Um, you know, I wanted you to respond to the aspect where you are asked of your negative in course perceptions of African elections, you know, is it a, a, a doomsday for African elections or is, is there is there is there a hope basically? Okay, that's a Who's fair question. Somewhere? Okay, that's a fair question. Okay, so as um, a, a political campaign practitioner, I'm I'm all for tech. I'm a tech evangelist. When I meet clients, I preach tech. Uh, I've trained social media teams, you know, to set up their social media command centers with remarkable success. Uh, so I know it, it works. Um, but also, um, I'm a Pan-Africanist, so I feel some type of way about this over-reliance on technologies that we have no control over. Um, you know, because I feel like when there's that uh, power imbalance, obviously it, it puts us at, at an an enviable position, and which is why I was asking, uh, are we like liberates, like what's happening? Because if you think about it, why does Somaliland need an iris recognition uh, technology? Of all the things that it could need, why is it the only country in the world that someone would think to bring that kind of technology to? So I'm sorry, the Pan-African in me jumped out here and there. Uh, I absolutely love tech. I'm a tech evangelist. Um, so uh, if you if you meet me wearing my campaign hat, I, I will. I mean, we will we'll both be tech romanticists together. But then in other spaces, I, I might sound skeptical. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that, that that is a fair take. Um, I think I will extend the same question to Catherine. Um, do you see South Sudan as um? going some way. Are you confident that the you highlighted a lot of uh, challenges that uh, that are there that seems like the political the politicians are not willing to to move on from a transitional uh, government uh, arrangements where they keep on negotiating and negotiating and, and how they stay in power. Um are you the same question Dr. Ando do you see us going somewhere or you're also very skeptical <laughs> that South Sudan is going to hold the elections? Uh Okay, yeah, uh, thank you. So I think uh, there's a question in the chat box. Let me just, um, someone was asking about the tactics of postpone the, you know, election and in terms of uh, voters, um, like uh, buying in votes or maybe intimidation. So looking at South Sudan context and at, at this particular time, I'm seeing that uh, the ruling party has nothing to lose because from what they are, they are putting out that, you know, they are campaigning uh, Juba is red, so that's their color, Juba is red, but then at the same time you look at the opposition, which is blue, there's a lot of intimidation for them even to do their campaign. So if you look at the ground, like there's this notion whereby they, the IG is more open to, you know, like yeah, we'll go for election and everything, but look at the, uh, if you look at the IO side, the opposition party, you know, they don't do campaigns and all this kind of thing, there's sort of intimidation. And was it last week, you know, especially IO, um, sort of uh, put a press statement and saying that they are open for a more, uh, you know, extension period because of the lot of the, you know, challenges that I've highlighted. And it's like, it's not visible for us to go for election in December because of one, two, three challenge. At the same time, if you look at the IG, they're like, yes, we are for the election. But then for me, my question here is the interest of the people because at the same time, and I think um, at the same time, the, 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 the postponement is is the, the situation is not changing. You know they will still have. You know we rather have a, a and and mind you this is the first election 
we are going to go for as a country. So we have never exercised our right to, you know, to, to vote for our leaders. But at the same time right now that the opposition party now is pushing more for extension and the SPLA IG saying that, no, we should go for the election regardless. So there's a lot of divide sort of like, you know, we we are not sure whether we can go for election or not, because if we are, if we are going for scenario A that we go for election, we know for sure that it's not going to be a fair election in terms of even for people, you know, even if I'm supporting IG in terms of my security, like you are mentioning about, you know, um, technology, if we put it in South Sudan context, it's, it, it's, it will not work because of the infrastructure that we have in place. So we move to radio. But then at the same time, you know, if we move to the Digambia whereby people line in queue, but look at, you know, you be identified that you are voting for political party B, the next thing, what is it like? What does it like? People are scared even to turn out to vote. They know that it's going to be IG. But at the same time that we have to move forward. So whether we go for election or not, the result is, is, is still going to be the same. And that's why I asked the question of like, in terms of democracy, we cannot say that we are faking it. We, we, we cannot say that we're starting our, you know, what kind of precedent in terms of our democratic process, process, what kind of precedent are we going to set? Are we going to go for election whereby citizens are not even sure for it? It's going to be our first election. What does it mean? So it's for us, it's a lot of questions rather than answers. But regardless, that's why I mentioned that we need to have a visionary, you know, we need to have a dialogue. We need to have a more, uh, a political conversation. We need to have a national dialogue to sort of like have a way forward for South Sudan as a country, but with the people aspiration at the end at the heart of it and that's why the conversation on the constitution is very important because that's where we sort of like have our social contract at that you know so in our case it, it's very complex the complexity it depends on where your interests lie and that's that's why we have a very divergent you know opinion so it's not a question of yes or no because all those negative factors yes you know it might you know yeah thank you thank you thank you yeah um it's, it's a complex matter i think which really needs to be explored even further. And as we are closing, uh, I think we have one minute. Um, I will ask um, Shannon to tackle the question from the anonymous attendee. You know, I feel like that speaks to South Africa more. Um, yeah, sure. So I think I'll just be using the South African example then to answer that question. So that's, I mean, that's a common question that's been put towards South Africans, uh, if you have all of these frustrations with the ANC government, why do you vote the ANC in? And there are two very important factors here. The one is called the silent majority of South Africans, and the second is the failure of our opposition. opposition. So the silent majority are those ANC voters who no longer vote, and they punish the ANC by not voting. And so then they make the pool of voter, um, the, the pool of the vote share much smaller and the opposition parties gain from that. If you look at the data, the DA and the EFF, the EFF is growing now, but previously it grew in such a way that it wasn't getting enough previous ANC voters on side. The DA likewise fails to do that almost wholeheartedly. So what you're looking at then is like a, the failure of the opposition. If you're not offering somebody an alternative that's viable, that excites them, that makes them want to vote for you, then how can you criticize them for choosing not to vote? So that's that's practically what we're looking at here. Um, there's two very important dynamics, that large proportion of the South African voting population who doesn't vote and haven't voted since 94, and then the failure of the opposition to get those people to vote for them. Right, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you um, to, to uh, I think we're coming to the end and I also thank our panelists. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deltando. Thank you, Catherine, Charles Vitaliano. Thank you, Shannon. Um, thank you, Kanyisa, for, uh, for, for responding to, 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 to our panelists and their presentations. Um, I think this has been a very worthwhile conversation and I think um, it's, a trigger for more conversations um, on on how things are going to to roll out. Uh, now, seeing that this was we are talking about what the future might look like, it will be interesting to see if we were right or we were wrong <laughs> as more elections begin to roll out. But thank you so much for for everyone that joined us. Um, have a, a good day and a happy International Women's Day. Thank you. Bye, everyone.